will be coming out of the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 18 through 24. Acts 8, 18 through 24. And when Simon saw that through the laying of hands, laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of, gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this manner, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. How do you respond to Jesus and His truth? In Deuteronomy chapter 18, and verse number 18, the Lord said to Moses, I will raise up a prophet like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth. And God said this great prophet would speak forth the words of God, and He said in verse 19, it will come to pass whosoever will not hear the words that this prophet will speak in my name, I will require it of him. Now Deuteronomy 18, verse 18 and 19, if you notice Acts chapter 3, that is a reference to Jesus. This was a prophecy concerning Jesus that he would be from the Israelite people. I will raise up a prophet, Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, from among your brethren, that's the Jewish people, like unto thee, like unto Moses. And God was going to speak through this great prophet. And in verse 19, whosoever would not hear what this prophet has to say, God is going to require it of that individual. Do you understand the way you respond to Jesus and His truth? Do you understand you're going to give an account to your Creator? It's not just a matter of you can live any way you please and all this stuff that we hear in America. The facts are you will stand before your Creator and you will give an account how you have responded to Jesus and His truth. James 1.21, James told us clearly in the New Testament, we must receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. That means implanted. The Word of God is to be implanted within our hearts. And we are to receive it with meekness. It has the ability, it has the potential to save us from hell. But we must receive it with all meekness. In Acts 17 verse 11, the Bible says, These were more noble than those at Thessalonica, in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind. Is that what you do? Is that what I do? The Holy Spirit gives us this example for all generations. This is what He requires of each and every one of us. Not just preachers and elders and deacons, but every person. Do we understand the seriousness of the way we respond to Jesus and His truth. Acts 20 verse 32, Paul talked to the elders at the church at Ephesus. And some of his last words were, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. 
The word that Jesus brought to this earth is able to build us up, admonish us, encourage us, and it's able to give us a home in heaven. 1 Peter 1 verse 22, these people had cleansed their souls by obeying the truth. Acts 2.42 The original church built by Jesus. Look what it says of them. Acts 2 verse 42 The King James Version of the Bible says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in breaking of bread and in prayers and in fellowship. That word in the original language means to be glued to something. To be attached to something. To cleave to something. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Wasn't a social club. Wasn't just a place where everybody came together and loved each other. Wasn't just a place to visit. The church we read about in the Bible that we are doing our best to duplicate in our age and our century, this is what they did. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Are you interested in the doctrine of the apostles? Are you interested in it? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse number 13. Paul was giving thanks to these brethren. He said, I give thanks to you continually. Thanks to God. Why? Because he said, when I preach to you, you receive that preaching just like it's the Word of God. He says, as it is in truth, not the Word of men, but the Word of God, which effectively works in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. When they heard Him preach, they accepted His Word, not like it was the Word of men, not like it was human ideas, not like it was His opinion and what He, this is the way I see it and this is what I believe. They accepted His Word as the Word of God. And that's what we need to hear more in our pulpits is the Word of God instead of what I think and what I believe and what I've studied and what my conclusions are. Our conclusions ought to be the Word of God. And that early church, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, the Word of God was working in them because they meekly accepted it. When they found out they were wrong, they repented, they changed their lives. They gave their whole lives to doing exactly what the Lord's new covenant instructed them to do. It was their whole life. It wasn't just Sunday and Wednesday. That was their life. In Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, verse number 5, Philip went down the city of Samaria and preached unto them Christ. Now remember, this is the Philip back in Acts chapter 6 that they laid their hands on him. Now he's going to do miracles. And he's doing all this preaching. He goes down the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them. Look at verse 12. When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. And then we learn in the next verse, next several verses, we learn about this man named Simon who had bewitched this entire city. He hears the gospel. How do you respond to Jesus and His truth? 
You know, you can look at the way different individuals responded and you can see yourself in there if you got the nerve to do it. How do you respond? When he heard the truth up against all this nonsense he had been telling all these people for all these years, he just accepted it. And Simon is baptized. Then the apostles come down and lay their hands upon these people. And the Bible says, When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he asked them, saying, He wanted to buy this power, that whomsoever he laid his hands upon, they would receive the Holy Spirit. He wanted to buy that. He should have been ashamed for thinking the gift of God could be bought with money. You know what? Notice what this man is told. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. How do you respond to that truth? Did he say, Don't judge me? Did he say, you have no right to judge my life? Did he say, my life is my business? What did he say? What would you have said? If you had been told, your heart is not right in the sight of God. That's a pretty plain statement, isn't it? Now this man is a Christian. He's become a New Testament Christian. And not very long after he became a Christian, he has sinned. What should be done? Just overlook it? Oh, we don't want to hurt his feelings. Don't want to scare him off. They boldly told him, your heart's not right in the sight of God. But my my question to you, how did he respond? Look at about verse 24. He didn't say, don't judge me. He didn't say, it's none of your business. He said, my life is my business. He didn't say any of that. He didn't make those kind of statements like you hear today. He didn't say, well, my understanding is just as good as yours. You believe it your way, I believe it my way. No. He said, pray to the Lord that none of these things that you have spoken come upon me. That's how he responded to the truth of Jesus. When you hear from the truth of Jesus that you are doing something that contradicts the New Testament Scriptures, what do you do about it? How do you respond? This is going to determine where you are in eternity. You know, it's a shame we're going to let pride keep us out of heaven, isn't it? Some folks just are not going to say, well, yeah, I was wrong. They're not going to do it. They'll say a lot of other things. They're not going to say that. Mark Harmon says you should never apologize. People think that's neat. That's not neat. That's ungodly. Pray to the Lord that none of these things come upon me that you've told me. That was his response. Now look at Matthew 26. I, I'm pardon me, Acts 13:46. Acts 13:46. Look at the complete opposite. You remember this is when Paul and Barnabas went went into 
Antioch of Pisidia and they start preaching the gospel and these people stand up and start contradicting what he's saying. Acts 13, 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you, but saying you have put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. That's the way they responded to the truth of Jesus. They rejected it. That's why they responded. Total rejection. Now I go back to verse 7. This is a Roman official by the name of Sergius Paulus. Know very little about him. Don't need to know much about him, just what it says here. He desired to hear the Word of God. Do you have that desire? Do you have the desire to learn the Word of God? This man had that desire. One of the few. But there was a false prophet named Bar Jesus. And he attempted to turn the deputy away from the truth. That's how he responded to the truth of Jesus. Tried to turn other people away from it. I've known people that wouldn't accept the truth, and that wasn't enough that they wouldn't accept it. They wanted to do everything they can to turn other people away from it. That's the way this guy is. Here's the only miracle in the Bible you'll read that hurts somebody. Only miracle in the Bible you'll read about that hurts somebody. When this man tried to turn this deputy away from the truth, Paul said, Thou child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you child of Satan. And he struck him blind. He struck him blind. Now what does that tell you? He could only do this by God's power. You say, oh, that was the main thing to do. Watch about what you say. The Creator's the one that really did this. When you respond that way to God's truth, this is how God feels about it. Struck Him blind. Matthew 26, verse 4. Can you imagine seeing the wonderful miracles of Jesus? Can you imagine what it would be like to see a man born blind and just automatically he can see, or somebody that's born lame and now they're leaping and praising God. Can, can you imagine seeing, and not the kind of stuff we see today, I'm talking about genuine miracles of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine being there and witnessing that? And can you imagine hearing the most beautiful words that's ever been spoken in human history by the Son of God, can you imagine hearing that come out of His mouth? Wouldn't that have been beautiful? You think we live in a wonderful time? Wouldn't it have been wonderful to be there when Jesus was there? And see how He acted toward people? to See how He related to people? See how He spoke to people? See His miracles? Hear His beautiful sermons? Wouldn't that have been wonderful? Well, these people got to do that. I want you to look at the results of their response. Matthew 26, 4. Here's their response to Jesus and His truth. They get together and they're trying to take a counsel how they can subtly take Jesus and put Him to death. That's their response. You see how hard we can be when someone contradicts our little lifestyle? When someone tells us we're not living right, do you see how we can be? Matthew 23, 34. Jesus said of the religious leaders of His day, He says, I'm going to send you prophets and wise men, scribes. He said, some of them you're going to kill. Some of them you're going to crucify. That's the way these people responded to the truth of Jesus. Kill the messenger. 
started out killing Jesus. That's not enough. Now they're going to continue to kill His messengers. They're going to stomp this message out from the earth. They didn't do a very good job, but they sure tried. That's how they responded to Jesus and His truth. Matthew 23, verse 4 and 5, Jesus tells you what their problem is. They were religious people. Those are the kind that scare me to death. They were religious. And all their religious stuff that they did, they did it just to get people to look at them. Look how, look how religious He is. Look how holy He is. Look how righteous He is. Just listen to those prayers. Jesus said they loved praying, this, standing out there in the streets and praying for everybody to look at them. All their works they do to be seen of men. So when Jesus comes along and contradicts all of that stuff, you see in Matthew 26, 4, Here's their response. This man's got to go. Not only does he have to go, he has to die. He makes us uncomfortable. He makes our family uncomfortable. He's got to go. And when I say he's got to go, I'm not talking about running him out of town. I'm talking about taking his life. He made them uncomfortable and He made their little families uncomfortable. So they said, get rid of Him. Get rid of Him. Every word that He said, they were standing there trying to find some little something wrong with it. They weren't interested in learning the truth. They just wanted to find Him in some little error. That's all they were. They weren't interested in what He was saying. They just wanted to find some little thing that He said that they could catch on to it and say, See, you were wrong here. You were wrong here. They hated Him. That's how they responded to the truth of Jesus. John 12. Jesus makes it crystal clear. It's not a matter that you don't understand it, my friend. It's a matter you don't accept it. It's not a matter you just can't get it. It's a matter you don't want to get it. That's the problem we have in America. John 12, 48. He that rejects me and does not receive my words, has one that judges him, the word I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Be careful that you don't reject something in the Bible. Because if you do, it's going to meet you on judgment day. Be careful that you're not living in a way you know you shouldn't be living and you hear it from this pulpit and you just ignore it because that will meet you on Judgment Day. You may come to every religious service that's ever been. You may do every good work. But if you're ignoring the words of eternal life, Jesus said in John 12, 48, those words will meet you on Judgment Day. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. How many of you in this audience have rejected those words for whatever reason? You've never been baptized. That's when your sins are forgiven, Acts 2.38. You've never obeyed that. You die in that condition. What a horrible thing. And how many of this audience have already been baptized into Christ and you know you're doing things that are not in accord with the New Testament and you just keep on doing it? That's going to meet you in Judgment Day. You can make it right. Right now. While we stand, while we sing.